بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode of Ask Iman Broadcasted live from the London studio of Iman channel on Sky 757 We're also streaming live on our social media platforms So please don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe to YouTube channel, Facebook and Instagram page Follow our Twitter handle And of course you can also watch this program through our website, imanchannel.tv. Since it's a live interactive Q&A program, humble reminder, 0203 515 is our studio number, our international viewers, and of course, any viewers, if you would like to drop in text, then you can use our WhatsApp service, and the number is displayed at the bottom of your screen. Of course, you can leave us your questions on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel in the comment box below. And inshallah, if time allows, we will try our level best to accommodate those questions live on air. I'm your host, Qamar al-Islam. Joining us today, virtually, none other than Fadilat al-Sheikh Shams al-Duha. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask Iman. Very unusual. Normally, we do programs together in the studio, but today we're virtually uh, doing the program. But alhamdulillah, your background looks very nice and amazing, I must say. Today the the roads were really bad. So indeed, no. indeed. But Jazakallah, uh, but Jazakallah. Thank you very much for giving us your valuable time. Uh, before we ta start taking the questions, let's start with our conversation. School holidays next week, and I'm sure it's uh, slightly longer than usual, and uh, a lot of weddings, receptions, and other things will be taking place. I'm sure you're invited to many of them. Now, how can we use this time to engage with our children and especially roles and responsibility of our parents in this holiday period? And how can we uh, perhaps utilize this time to make our children come closer to Islam? Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Salam, Ala Rasulillah, Wa Ala Alihi Wa Ashabihi Wa Man Wala Amma Baat. So, very broad question, but I'll begin by saying that 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 obviously there's there's a lot of concern around COVID already, and a lot of adjustments. I've already come across people who are bringing wedding dates forward. I just did a nikah um, a couple of days ago that was meant to be a couple of weeks later, and it was changed solely because you know COVID uh, it has it has become unpredictable again so i think i'll begin first of all by really asking everyone to make dua for themselves and for all of us that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us uh during this time and protects us from you know the both the calamities of illness and death but also of lockdowns and social isolation and all of the problems that are associated with that so while people are, I've noticed that while people are looking forward to holidays and things like that and plans and so on, I already am noticing that many plans are already getting disrupted and people are already becoming nervous about interactions and things like that. So, so uh, I suppose the, f the first thing is to request everyone's du'as and the second thing is to ask everyone to also be mindful that things are changing. You know, face masks are back. Um, I think work from home recommendations are back and things are changing almost almost every few days. So so keep an eye on the rules, inshallah ta'ala, um, uh, as the holidays approach and keep your families and keep your children safe and yourself safe. Um, in terms of um, in terms of our children and the deen and you know it one one holiday period isn't going to um, isn't going to make things or break things. Um, I think the people who people for whom how holidays are spent, um, if it is reflective of um, of you know of Dean and 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 so on, uh, then that's usually part of a wider pattern. You know that's how all holidays will be. Uh, and when that's not the case, then one holiday kind of. Uh, it isn't going to solve anything, but it is something for all of us to contemplate how we spend time with our children uh, and so on, but not just for the holidays, but really for all times. And what I will say is um, I don't think holidays is a time necessary to overload our children with religious messaging um, and religious activities and events and so on and so forth, but rather 
there needs to be a balance, there needs to be balance and moderation. Um, and there needs to be planning. So if you're planning something for the holidays for your children that's uh, religious in nature, it could be talks, it could be an event or two, it could be it could be some learning, some education, then it's a good idea to make sure that these things are discussed in advance and you have the children's buy-in. One of the things that we all have to use our hikmah and our wisdom to try to avoid in this day and age is imposing religious religious activities on children at a time that that they associate with relaxation and leisure um because what that does is is it creates a negative association with deen that by definition um whenever whenever something religious comes up or whenever mom and dad bring something religious up or a religious activity up it necessarily entails um the the loss of our leisure the deprivation of fun and enjoyment. And I think this association is one that we should avoid. Um, if you are a practicing family, then, then important, the most important things you could do to keep religion in your children's life is number one, make sure that they have a good Islamic education. And if, that, if, if these things aren't in place now, then you can start making the intention and transitioning towards these things. I don't think the holidays is a major factor. Everything has to fit in. Everything has to contextually fit in. If we say, you know, I know of families that are falling apart, literally falling apart at the seams um, because, because suddenly mum or dad, one or both, have become religious and they are stifling their children. And their religiosity has become literally a living nightmare for their kids and that's when basically religiosity comes into people's lives and wisdom seems to vacate it vacate it so it's really important so um, please avoid this this association where religion it becomes associated with the, the with, with with loss of leisure time with loss of fun loss of enjoyment and what i was saying is that Really, the things that we we want is we want to make religious we, we want to make religious life smooth and habitual, so that religious life our religious lifestyles are indeed matters of lifestyle that 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 are smooth and that are part and parcel of our of our daily, weekly, and monthly activities. So, for example, things like regularly going to the masjid for salah or regularly doing salah by jama at home that creates the association in a child's mind that I'm from a religious family, right? You know, we value salah in jama'ah. Or, for example, making sure that children pray and that they, they get up for fajr and they pray all of their salawat and so on. And that's something that's just part and parcel of their lives. It's not seen as a burden because it's something that they've always done, right? And I was saying that one of the first things also is making sure that our children receive a good... Uh, and a good Islamic education. That's absolutely fundamental. And I don't think a holiday fixes that. So my advice to, to, to people is actually perhaps contrary to what's being expected here. My advice really is that don't deprive the children of their holidays because of, re because of religion. Balance the things out. Let holidays be holidays. Let them have fun. And if you want to build a religious environment around your home, then that should be for... For, for your daily life. And when it comes to our daily life in terms of our salah and our dhikr and our ibadah, then that remains the same even when we're on holiday. Even when we go on holiday, even if you go abroad on holiday, thank you. To, 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 to a, to a sun soaked land, you still pray, you still do your ibadah. Thank you. Thank you, inshallah. Uh, we'll continue. Of course, the key word is planning and let our children enjoy. And of course, we have to do it in moderation. Sheikh, literally, I've got. Um, Two minutes. Let's see if we can cover this question, uh, if you can keep it short. It's a generated question, will be displayed on our screen. What is the best way to do istighfar and what are the benefits, briefly? Um, so first of all, istighfar means seeking forgiveness. So everybody must understand what it means first, right? Istighfar means seeking forgiveness. So seeking forgiveness must, of course, reflect that sense inside of ourselves if you're seeking forgiveness that means you're seeking for forgiveness for your mistakes from your errors from your sins and so on and the general understanding is istighfar simply involves 
asking Allah for forgiveness. Oh Allah, I seek your forgiveness. And it's a general, it's a general seeking of forgiveness using words like astaghfirullah. That's it, right? Astaghfirullah, I seek Allah's forgiveness. But I think one of the things we should try to do is mean it when we say it, all right? And it's understood that astaghfirullah, when, when we seek forgiveness by just that statement, um, then it is it becomes a kind of incantation. It's, it's almost like because we, we, we sin regularly, we also seek forgiveness regularly. And in that way, when it is done in that way, then it removes the, the effect and the burden of minor sins. And it is in that sense, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is said to have sought forgiveness from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala 70 to 100 times a day. Thank you, Sheikh. Inshallah, I'll come back to you, Inshallah. It's time for a short break because we've got four segments. Um, on the In the second segment, Inshallah, we'll touch the benefits and I'll definitely come back to you from the hadith that you've just quoted. My dear viewers, if you've just uh, tuned into Iman Channel, then you're watching Ask Iman live on Iman Channel on Sky 757. We're also streaming live on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. So please don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe to all our social media platforms. We'll be right back in a few moments. Do stay uh, tune with us. Keep watch. Keep watching Aman Channel. Thank you very much. Welcome back. You're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel Sky 757. I'm your host, Qamar al-Islam, in conversation with Sheikh Samshul Doha. Now, there was a question asked, a generated question, in fact, in the first segment. And uh, the question, just uh, in case if anyone uh, have just joined with us now, and the question was, what is the best way to do istighfar and what are the benefits? Of course, the detailed answer of the in the first segment, you can find it on our Facebook page and, of course, our YouTube channel. Remaining part, what are the benefits, inshallah, we'll continue with this uh, question. Sheikh, over to you, and if you'd like to summarize, if you have missed, because you're mentioning about a hadith of doing istighfar 70 to 100 times, and then we can move on to the benefits. Yeah, so I was saying that um, as uh, istighfar as a means of just seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is an acknowledgement of how frequently we commit sins, particularly minor sins, and as such, we're kind of almost seeking forgiveness is almost like a dhikr. It's like a form of, it's like an incantation. It's like words that we repeatedly say. Um, uh, in fact, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises believers who, uh, who, who, whenever they do something wrong or whenever they, whenever they say something obscene, uh, Allah praises people who, whenever they commit something obscene uh, or something shameless, um, or, or they wrong themselves in some way, they remember Allah, right? Allah. They remember Allah and they seek forgiveness, i.e., they make istighfar for their sins, right? And Allah says, وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And who is there to, to forgive sins except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And as such, istighfar is really to just say astaghfirullah. That is how you do it, but you should understand it and you should mean it. And in at least in that basic way, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to make istighfar 70 to 100 times a day. And therefore, istighfar it has been, is recommended as a form of daily remembrance or a, a way in which Allah is remembered, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by seeking forgiveness uh, from him. And therefore, um, people should make istighfar, you know, um, at like a, a hundred times a day is often recommended right, by teachers and by scholars. The other thing about istighfar, um, of course, is that the immediate follow-up of istighfar is of to is of toba. And I might distinguish, they say, General istighfar, when we just kind of, via the remembrance of Allah, we make istighfar, it removes our minor sins. But for any major sins committed, we have to actually repent. And repentance involves, involves regretting what we've done, uh, uh, removing ourselves from the sin and promising not to commit the sin in the future. Uh, whereas istighfar is, a, is just generally kind of removing the burden of minor sins as we commit them because those are difficult for people to avoid. 
Um, but in terms of benefits of istighfar, there are many, and I'll just mention a few. Obviously, it's a big deal. If we commit sins all the time, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given an, giving us an easy way for them to be forgiven is a major benefit, right, of istighfar. But other things, you know, uh, ulama often use the verse in Surah Nuh um, uh, and elsewhere as evidence of some of the benefits of istighfar because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, th- uh, he tells the story of Nuh alayhi salam when he says to his people, Istaghfiru rabbakum innahu kana ghaffara. Seek forgiveness from your Lord, um, for he is forgiving. Yursil is sama'a alaykum midrara. He will send the rains upon you abundantly. And he will assist you with wealth and with children. And he will give you gardens and he will give you rivers. As if to say that one of the benefits of istighfar is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives in the gives abundance in the dunya. Right? Um, you know, some people when they say uh, when they seek advice and say, I'm not, I, I, I want children, but I'm struggling to have them. Sometimes, you know, it's recommended that they do istighfar because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the people, uh, told Nuh alayhi salam to say to his people to make istighfar because, because of the istighfar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with Allah. children. But there are many benefits. These are just a few, inshallah. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's move on swiftly and moving on to our callers. Let's see who's on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you? Alhamdulillah, fine. Is it Dr. Zina all the way from Florida? Yes, sure. I am. Thank you. Thank you very much for calling in and all the way from across the pond. Yes, your question, my dear sister. First of all, you are always we benefit from the program. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. And okay, now my, my question is about inheritance. If somebody have only two or three daughters or no son, uh, and if they are allowed to uh, divide every inheritance in the lifetime. So after the person dies, sibling cannot take it, or only one third of the inheritance is allowed in your lifetime to give whomever you want. Okay, while you're alive. Yes, is, is it while you're alive you're asking about the distribution? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay, yes. fine. And yeah. you, you've said uh, two or three daughters and no son. Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Fine. No problem. Thank you, my dear sister, Dr. Zina, all the way okay. from Florida. Uh, appreciated your phone call. Moving on swiftly to our Sheikh. Okay. Bismillah. So, in the case of inheritance where there are only daughters and no sons, um, normally, uh, before deciding, before assuming that all of the inheritance belongs to the daughters. Um, you have to check the. You have to check this perhaps with a local scholar or or an inheritance specialist because there is a possibility in some scenarios that some close extended male relatives may also um, may also inherit a, sh- a small share. So just so that's the first uh, sort of caveat. That's the first thing to remember, inshallah. So check that. Um, with somebody who does inheritance locally, that means that that means that what that basically means is that just um, just saying that you have only daughters and no sons wouldn't be sufficient information to to work out what the full division is, because in that very speci- in that scenario, extended male relatives can have a right to a small portion. So that needs to be checked first of all. The second part of the question is about whether or not um, whether or not inheritance can be distributed while uh, while alive, and th- this question about the one third. So um, the one third of one's inheritance is their own right, meaning or, or the one third of somebody's estate is is what is that which they can spend um, on their discretion as well as that which is spent upon them after they pass on things like the cost of the funeral and so on and so forth. If, you know, if that's what is required in order to cover the cost of, uh, you know, of, of their death, death and so on. Also, you know, and things like that. And also all inheritance is after debts paid, if there are any debts. Whether you're able to distribute inheritance while alive, that's a practical question that it, that's 
not necessarily a question of inheritance, since by definition, inheritance kicks in after death. So this is a separate question about whether my wealth, why? because while you are alive, it is your wealth. It's not your estate because you're alive. So generally, while one is alive, they can do what they want with their wealth, right? However, there's one rule, and that rule is that when a person has reached old age and anticipates death, they should not, they should not, um, they should not deal in their wealth in an in a manner that could be deemed to be depriving their children of their inheritance, right? Depriving their inheritors, given that they are the very ones for which this rule exists, it therefore goes without saying that with their approval, money can be distributed to them while the parents are alive. Provided that you've done all of the research and you've checked that no inheritors are being, no inheritors, no automatic inheritors are being deprived. If any automatic inheritors are being de deprived, then it is a good idea to ensure that, um, that they that they give approval right that they give approval um however if a person you know is not sick is not unwell they're not on deathbed or anything like that they don't have a terminal illness then the the, the principle is simple it's still their wealth wealth if they were to give that out to their children now it is entirely their prerogative especially if they it's their children who are going to inherit it anyway Hopefully that 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 clear that answers the question. I think what I'm saying is I'm saying it's two separate things. Inheritance is always after death. Before death, it's still your wealth to do with as you wish. However, if a person is nearing death, I mean they've reached an, an, an age at which people normally are reaching the end of their lives, then they shouldn't dispose of their wealth in a way that deprives their inheritance. And as long as you take that into consideration, you can go ahead and you know and distribute the wealth among your daughters now. Thank you very much. Obviously, sometimes this is, by the way, I should also add, sometimes this is prudent because of the fact that there are tax implications upon inheritance. That's it. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you made it very clear. And I'd like to clarify and uh, add a caveat there. Um, please treat this as a generic guidance. Do not take it a conclusive remark because inheritance and uh, issues regarding inheritance is very difficult to give uh, um, a specific answer to any specific question. And it's solely because we need to know the whole story and life programs such as this. Uh, it, it, we don't have that kind of accommodation. It's not possible. So that's why, as Sheikh has mentioned before, please speak on a one to one basis with a qualified scholar to understand according to the needs of your family. And inshallah, if you have any questions, then of course, 0203 5150757. And thank you very much, my dear sister, for calling in all the way from Florida. You're watching Ask Iman. We'll be right back in a few moments. Thank you. Welcome back. You're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel on Sky 757 in conversation with Sheikh Shamsul Duha. Inshallah, we'll continue our conversation. But before that, we'll be taking our callers. But just a humble reminder, 0203 5150757 is our studio number. WhatsApp number 0791684-1483 is our WhatsApp number. And of course, our international viewers, like always, um, can ask questions by calling in directly using our WhatsApp number. In the second segment, we had Dr. Zina all the way from Florida calling in and asked such an important question. Uh, once again, thank you very much, my dear sister, for calling in, asking such an important question. And of course, we once again would like to thank you for your kind acknowledgement. Now, moving on swiftly to our next caller. Let's see who is next on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much for calling in. Your question, please. Basically, um, my question is to Shaykh, and my query is to Shaykh. Probably you saw this news on internet as well as um, Haramain website mm -hmm. that uh, they start in the virtual viewing of um, Hazra Aswad, the black stone. Mm -hmm. After a lot of controversies um, on um, social media, Okay. Um, so um, even I saw, like, you know, people saying, like, you know, it's a bid'ah. So what's your question? I, what's your specific question? My question is that um, what is the um, opinion of Shaykh um, about this matter in light of uh, Sharia? Is, okay. it, is it correct 
or is he is he uh, something wrong we we seen and is he going to bring some sort of um you know controversies and differences okay. between the Sahel and um, okay. uh, people who who have like you know sort of very emotional attachment Um, okay. with these sort of activities. Just your question, yeah, Barakallah, your question is very clear. And to our viewers, um, if you are not sure what the uh, respected caller was speaking, it's basically on the Twitter feed of Haramain, there was a news published, uh, President of Haramain, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Sudeh, is participating in an inauguration of the virtual Blackstone Initiative. And it's, uh, pub it was published on 13th of December, which is literally two or three days ago. Now, Sheikh, uh, regarding that, I understand it's a contemporary matter. Uh, there's a lot of controversy. Or I would rather say some controversy regarding this matter. Um, I, our I, I, viewer I, I, wanted to... I've come across the story. Yes, so I just uh, wanted to give that backdrop to our viewers, those who are not aware. Um, your thoughts on that, please. Okay, Bismillah. So this is, look, uh, I, first of all, I really um, discourage people from taking news from social media, uh, especially um, reading into the purpose behind things from social media. So I have heard about it, and I to be honest, didn't pay much attention because I didn't think it was a big deal. And I don't understand why it should be a big deal. What seems completely logical to me, and I would be very, very surprised it was if it was any different, and please do let us know if it is, that this is nothing more than using technology as a form of, you know, as a, as a tool to give people a, a kind of educational virtual immersive experience with the Hajar Aswad. No different to, do you remember there used to be these post people used to send around uh, 360 degree tours of Masjid Nabawi and things like that, or 350 degree kind of all directional views of Masjid Nabawi and so on. So I see it as something along those lines. By no means is this going to open up the doors for people to do the Istilam virtually using a Um, what do you call it, a virtual headset or something like that. No, that's not the purpose of this, all right? Technology is there. The idea is, you know, if you want to see what it's like to see the Hajar Aswad, you know, in front of you without any obstructions of crowds and so on and so forth, then this is a virtual way to do it. And do you know what? Why not do something like that if you've got a, a PlayStation 5 or some other instrument at home and people are basically using it for all sorts of nonsense. Why not something like this? So I would say that it's an, it's a nice, it's an interesting use of technology to perhaps present a, a 3D educational tool for children perhaps, and for people, um, if anything, it, uh, if it's used pro properly, it will encourage people to go to the Haramein. Now, I'm not saying that's what the objective is. I'm saying it, it seems to make sense to me that that can only be the objective. Right. So if that's the objective, then it's got there's there's no question of whether it's a bid'ah ah or not. There will be no bid'ah ah and there should be no controversy. So I haven't seen any authoritative news feed that says that this is an attempt at replacing the Islam of the Hajar Aswad. If you Thank have, you. then let me know. I haven't seen it and I don't think that's the purpose at all. Thank you very much. And I'd like to uh, carry on with a point here. Let's not make our own conclusion and judgment. It's a very contemporary issue. We are taking the advantage of technology and uh, let's wait for it. And if there are any issues, there are ulama there, there are qualified ulama out there. Inshallah, they will be discussing these matters. Uh, moving on swiftly to our next question, Sheikh. It's a very relevant question, especially during this month, uh, as we are in the festive period. And the viewer is asking, Assalamu alaikum, are we allowed to wear a Christmas jumper or have Christmas lunch or meal at a workplace, not to celebrate a party, but in general, like a team building exercise or team getting together? Your thoughts? Um, look, there's a lot, Ulama will say lots of different things um, about this. The way I approach it is not strictly from the point of view of is it permissible or is it not? I simply first challenge anybody who's asking questions like this as to why why would you want to do it in the first place because you're not required to no employer will require you to do it especially nowadays nowadays to require employees to do things like that is really really controversial right you can turn up to a christmas party wearing completely casual clothes it's not a problem and you know what you'll see in workplaces many non-muslims will do that nowadays there are many non-muslims atheists 
who have a problem with Christmas celebrations being imposed upon them, right? It's a cultural event, right? However, if for argument's sake, you know, for in a cultural context, you were required to wear Christmas attire, do you know what? You should complain. Why should you be required to wear Christmas attire? And when it comes to the question of, oh, I want to fit in, et cetera, et cetera, then you shouldn't. Look, the point is that this is once upon a time, there was genuine pressure upon people to, to conform to the expectations of Christmas, Christmas celebrations and the culture of the festive period. That expectation is now gone, right? It does not exist. The idea of Christmas being this all kind of pervasive British social phenomenon is nothing more than a corporate exercise. It's nothing more than an, than, than an excuse to sell goods, right? It's nothing beyond that. It's no longer a embedded cultural phenomenon that people are expected to follow, right? Non-Muslims complain when, when people are imposing, people, non-Muslims complain if, they, if, if somebody says Merry Christmas to them because of the fact that, well, I don't celebrate, how do you know I celebrate Christmas? So my point is, you know, sometimes we create that pressure upon ourselves. That pressure, as far as I know it and understand it, no longer exists. Now let's come to the religious side. On the religious side, ulama have differing views about this. Some are relaxed about it. Other ulama, most ulama still see this as, as conforming to the dictates of something that still has ties to religion, to another religion, right? Even though Christians themselves don't say it's religious, it's religious, but it is it, it has become something that is symbolic in Christianity. And as such, um, and given the different views of ulama on this, it's best that Muslims avoid it. It is better for us to avoid things like that. And the reason why I started answering it the way I did is to demonstrate that given that that you know, really we have no reason, right, to adopt the festive culture, no reason. Right, we have our own festivities. We should. We have no reason to adopt these cultures. There is no argument to 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 feel the need to do it because really the pressure, the social pressure that used to exist before, has now eased off. So really, these types of things have now become completely unnecessary. That's my approach to this type of question. Thank you, but there was a specific question here. Of course, you're right. There is a Christmas jumper. It's not mandatory. It's optional. If someone wants to wear it, they can wear it. Understandable. We're not saying that's mandatory. And most of the workplace, in fact, I don't know of any workplace that mandates it to be a mandatory. Uh, it's mostly optional, so I know that for a fact. Now, the question here is, we have got Christmas lunch. So that's where the question I was trying to um, ask. Now, go the name the may lunch. be Christmas lunch, but it's actually a get together of the team after no, working. Go to the lunch. I, uh, the question wasn't about the lunch. The question was about attire. I mean, um, it's wrong with going to the lunch. Okay, great. Uh, not a problem at all. It's just because people are very much concerned because it has a name attached to it, Christmas. So that's why should we go, should we not go? Um, your, your take on that? The lunch is a lunch, and this is that's to do with. Um, this is simply a question of just socialising with your colleagues, and this is where it does get complicated. I'll tell you why, because Briefly. in an environment where increasingly um, there's sort of interfaith type of activities going on, there is every chance that in workplaces where there are Muslim, uh, Mus there are there are Muslim societies and Muslim groups, Muslims when it comes to Eid will organize things for Eid. They, they might organize an Eid lunch. When we organize our Eid lunches and we invite non-Muslims to come, and we, sometimes we do it with the intention of Dawah, etc., we also we expect them to come. And we also understand if they don't want to come. Does that make sense? Yeah. But but then if, if we are, it, can, it, sounds, it doesn't sound right if we feel that we want to organize Muslim events and invite people to those events and give them food, but don't kind of reciprocate when the same invitation is extended to us. So social invitations, social invitations around these times, um, knowing that the, the, the religious connotation is a weak connotation. It's just okay, Sheikh, I'll have to interrupt you there. Um, I'll come back and we'll find out more about in details after this short break. Thank you very much. You're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel.
Welcome back to the last segment of Ask Iman, live on Iman channel, in conversation with Sheikh Shamsul Duha. We have been discussing about Christmas party, Christmas jumper, and Sheikh was giving answers beautifully. But towards the last, uh, we have to just conclude the answer, and then inshallah, we'll swiftly move on to our YouTube questions. And thank you very much uh, once again uh, for sending us so many questions on our YouTube and, of course, our WhatsApp. Sheikh, now we were discussing about the Christmas uh, dinner, in fact, lunch, and you were talking about reciprocating because we do Eid lunches or Eid dinners, whatever it is. So we reciprocate or we should be expecting. Uh, of course, uh, things do reciprocate like that. Now, you can complete your conversation and we'll move on swiftly well, to the I next question. I, I don't want people to misunderstand me. All of these types of things have a context, right? Yeah. If the context in your workplace is one of you're part of a small team and everybody's getting together uh, for lunch before you break up for holidays and things like that around the Christmas period, then something like that I would say that people should participate in because it's a small party. In companies where there's 20, 30, 40, 50 employees and there's a big Christmas do and it's nothing, just it's just a party. Those are the kind of things that people should try to get out of if they can. Because they're not, it's not just dinner, it's not a particularly conducive environment. Alcohol is allowed and people are just there to have a good time. And those things don't culturally fit in with us. Those are the ones that should be avoided. And anybody that's in the workplace, I think, should be able to easily differentiate between the two things based on my answer. Thank you very much for beautifully addressing the question. And if in doubt, of course, you can call us 0203-515-0757. And of course, our WhatsApp number 0791684-1483. Now, moving on swiftly to our next question. And inshallah, we will be taking this question from YouTube. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. When can one pray Salat al-Istikhara? And how should they read it? Like, when should they recite the Istikhara dua in Salah? Um, you can see namaz on the screen. Of course, it basically means salah. Sheikh, over to you. Okay. Um, so you can you can do the istikhara salah whenever you want. It's two rakats of nafal. All right, so okay. two rakats of nafila. Um, and there's no istikhara dua inside the salah, by the way. So the okay. sunnah is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught the sahaba istikhara. Um, you know, in all of their affairs. And he taught them the dua of istikhara, the long dua, Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi'ilmika wa astakhiruka bi'qudratika. You can look this up in dua books. But you read the, the istikhara dua, um, and it's good to do two rakats of salah before you do it. And the dua is a dua. You can raise your hands and make the dua as you normally make dua. And in the dua, there's, there's two points at which the dua says, "In kunta ta'lamu anna hadha al-amra." Oh Allah, if you know that this matter, so on one occasion, if you know that this matter is good for me, then decree it for me. And on another part, it says, "If you know that this matter is bad for me, then distance me from it." When you when you say hadha al-amr, or when you say this matter, you you intend or you think of the matter that you're making istikhara for. Another important clarification about istikhara is that istikhara is not istishara. When you make istikhara, you're not trying, you're not asking Allah to tell you what to do, right? Although sometimes people see dreams and things like that that give them indications, that can happen anyway. Istikhara is asking Allah for goodness in what you are doing. So therefore, what happened, what you do is, as you make your, as you go through the process of making a decision to do something, whether it's a job or a marriage proposal, etc., you go through the normal process of deciding, and that should be looking at the pros, looking at the cons, you know, meeting people, having conversations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If it's a job, looking at everything, the whole package, and so on, consulting people, um, you know, you do all of those things as you do them, and then when you are making a decision, as you go through your normal decision decision making process. Right, as you, you when you're about to make your decision, you make istikhara, so that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala either puts good in it, puts good in it, if you are, if you end up doing it, and protect and and, and saves you from it if you are not if it's bad for you. Right, so that's basically what you do, and this is so essentially what happens is you have your decision making process. Istikhara should be a part of it. Okay. That's how it's done. There's no dua inside of salah, you make the dua outside the salah. 
Thank you very much. And of course, that dua can be found in Hisl Muslim. And these days, if you Google it, you will be easily, it will be very easy for you to find the dua. And Sheikh, you mentioned, uh, I just wanted to clarify, uh, in all affairs, we have to say, uh, speak, um, we have to um, pray Salat al Istikhara. Um, I'm assuming you're saying in all lawful affairs because we can't be asking any haram thing or praying yeah, for any yeah. istikhara. I, and some ulama say that there's no istikhara in things that are obligatory, things that you must do because they already decided for you. If Allah's, if Allah's commanded you to do something, you don't, you don't, you, it is good in it already. And if Allah has forbidden you to do something, if it's haram, then then there can never be any good in it. Thank you. It's, it's, it's impermissible matter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next question. Um, you uh, work on this subject, on this matter, and uh, I would consider you one of the experts in this field. Um, so let's see. Uh, the question is, Assalamu alaikum. I'm being your show live now, Ask Iman, live. I want to ask a quick question on behalf of a friend who states he has been having doubts, confusion about the deen, etc. He's after rational and logical arguments as we do to make sense of things. Philosophical questions, the likes of why hellfire, why all this trouble in the world, suicidal thoughts, etc. Sheikh, over to you. Jazakallah khair. Okay, um, th there isn't a specific question in there. So, um, my advice, and I don't know where you're based, etc. My advice is, of course, if a person has questions, doubts are questions. Essentially, that's what they are. When a person has doubts, they've got questions and they want answers to those questions. Um, and they have every right to answers. So they should they should be able to ask those questions. So I would say find someone in your locality um, or online who will be able to answer this person's question or fa find the answers online. I don't know if I'm allowed to uh, mention any organizations or not right now, but the, the, uh, the most important thing is if a person has doubts, it's because they have questions, they have the right to have those questions answered. As a community, we should be able to answer those questions. We should not dismiss them. And they should be, and however, because we've we've developed this culture of not engaging with these kind of things, there usually aren't a lot of people who can answer these types of philosophical questions. So the challenge is to find somebody who can, right, and to seek their help or find a platform online that um, basically specializes in these types of things and then referring this person, your friend, uh, to them, inshallah. And if I'm, if I'm allowed to, I can mention some resources. Okay. Jazakallah khair for that. Um, of course, there are certain restrictions in place, but inshallah, um, uh, you can contact Sheikh, our guest, and he will be more than happy to discuss these matters in private, inshallah. You're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel on Sky 757-0203-5150757, our studio number, our WhatsApp number 0791684-1483. If you have any questions, you can, of course, drop in uh, text. And, of course, our international viewers can use the WhatsApp number. Now, next question we'll be taking from our YouTube channel. Assalamu alaikum. Um, how to deal with a pathological liar in Islam, especially when the person is a close relative? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I hope nobody minds me saying this, but these types of questions are strange questions um, because, you know, um, I've heard people accusing people of being pathological liars when they're not. True. Um, and I've had people i've seen people believe people who are in fact pathological liars there is no there is no hard and fast rule to these things first of all we have to be making judgments based on intelligent thought processes and based on proof and evidence if somebody is clearly um and and you know and you have proof and evidence and they are known to be a, a pathological liar um then um you deal then they the, then what they're doing is they're committing a sin some people commit sins by drinking alcohol some people commit sins by being pathological backbiters some people commit sins by uh you know by take by selling alcohol some people commit sins by dealing in usury and for all of these people uh we give them nasiha we try to help them uh, we try to advise them, um, and so on. The basic rules of engagement are the same. They don't change because we have a particularly negative opinion of the person. 
So uh, what I'm what I would like to see is, uh, and again, I, I don't want to assume things, but from the question, I'm I'm understanding that there is a very negative view of this other person. So I think we should change our view to a view of nasiha, so that we're willing to give nasiha to this person. But also, we should be intelligent enough to avoid um, being harmed by such a person. Sometimes a person's sin is such that when you engage them to give them nasiha and so on, they can also cause you harm. So you kind of have to also, you, you have to risk assess your situation as well. But the basic rules of engagement for all kinds of sinners are the same, that we should try to engage them through nasiha, through wanting the best for them and Thank wanting you. to help them give up that sin. Thank you very much, my dear Sheikh. Uh, our time is up uh, once again. Uh, thank you very much for giving us your valuable time. And inshallah, in our future episode, we'll be speaking with you from the studio itself. Uh, my dear viewers, uh, my thanks goes to all the viewers who have watched the program, called in live into the studio, sent us sent us questions through our WhatsApp and YouTube channel. And apology, we couldn't uh, take all your questions. But inshallah, in our future episode, do please uh, participate and engage. Uh, and tomorrow is Ask Him on Urdu, so don't forget to ask questions in Urdu. Until next time, subhanakallah wa hamdik. نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والسلام عليكم